Welcome to the January cohort meeting. We're going to start with the plant share. I want to thank Beryl and Jeff, Mary, Charlotte, Kristen, Mark, and Janet for sharing in the plant forum. So Beryl, she has the uh, Cestrum noelii, which is evidently blooming now. Yeah, and I I don't know if I mentioned this. I, I was pruning one of my clients' Cestrums, which I actually planted in, in their garden. And so um, I now have two Cestrum shrubs. This picture shows the arching form that it is known for. The other one that I have gets more sun and it's completely vertical at this point. So I'm not really sure, you know, I guess eventually if the stems get long enough, the, that other one will start arching also. But um, th this is not very commonly available, which is why I propagated it. It's in the uh, Solanum family. And uh, any questions? Blooming right now, evidently, because uh, evidently Devil Mountain says um, spring through fall. So it's still blooming? It just started blooming last month. Oh, okay. Because the stuff that you sent from uh, Devil Mountain says it blooms spring through fall. So evidently maybe around here year round. Yeah, it's a little, con that's a little confusing because other websites have a variation on what Devil Mountain says. Mm -hmm. And I have never actually seen the berries, maybe because I prune it too soon, but that may be a, a conflict, you know? Do you prune the flowering um, stems after they're done flowering all the way to the ground or, and let it come up again or? Well, in these two shrubs that I have in my backyard, I have never pruned. Oh, okay. Uh, I used to prune my client's shrub because I needed to keep it more vertical. So I I don't know. I'm not going to prune this. I'm hoping to get berries. Some of the write-ups say that, that hummingbirds are attracted to this. So I'm not planning on pruning it, even, even though it's arching a lot. I want to give it a chance to see what happens. Devil Mountain is based out here where I am. And it may be that it starts later in the spring, but I know we've been having a very warm winter to begin with here. And so even for your yard, although it seems to be early according to what they're saying, I'm sure that you're warmer than even we are. Because we hardly, yeah. I mean, I've had frost, but the low temperature has been 27, which is like nothing for me. I used to see 18. Now, I have a different cestra, uh, and it's also blooming right now. It's got uh, little purple flowers. And it's grow the same shape, the fountain shape, big fountain shape, or no, mine is, is it more like a uh, night blooming jasmine? Very stiff, upright uh, branches, and very what you say congested. <laughs> they're they're close together, pretty vertical. Yeah, I didn't know about cestrums with purple flowers. That's interesting. Do you know the name? There used to be a lot of them on the market. They're yellow and purple, and I don't remember if there was orange. There were. I had them all for a while, and then they all eventually died off. I got it from Striving. I mean, it's a pinky purple. It's not, you know, purple okay. purple. But um, might be a variance of this then. Okay, report back. Okay, Jeff, this okay. is exciting stuff. So what I'm showing here is a little bit of a uh, background and uh, how it got started and where we are today of some uh, guerrilla gardening on city land here in San Francisco. This uh, map on the right shows uh, the location of a pedestrian ramp that will take you up from West Portal, uh, Granville Way up to Portola, and then you can cross Portola uh, to San Pablo Ave or wherever. <clears throat> it's uh, just... Uh, to the west of a, a real pedestrian overpass uh, that is above Portola. In any case, uh, what this looks like today is in the left two pictures, uh, mostly uh, along the tip where it gets full sun. If you can go to the next picture, oh, go back, there we go. What prompted me to do this was that the city kind of stopped doing any maintenance of this and uh, English Ivy took over and so you can see on uh, the outsides, a huge carpet of English ivy flowing down from the upper ramp on the bottom left picture. And then in the top right picture, you can see that that's the view from Portola. 
And if you were to go into that upper portion of the ramp, uh, it became like a cave between the mm. uh, English ivy and cotoneaster coming in from above. Um, and a lot of residents were uh, became disinclined to use it as a result of how closed in it was. It didn't feel safe. And uh, so I started in, uh, in 2020 when I started uh, being at home during the pandemic and um, just kind of became a project. I had to use these uh, pictures from um, Street View, uh, Google Street View, because I uh, didn't realize the extent to which this was going to become a a life-changing project for me because I just kept going and going. Um, the bottom right picture shows uh, the fully removed uh, English ivy from the picture on the left. Uh, so you can see that the city wasn't even able to paint underneath the, uh, the ivy. Uh, they just kind of didn't do anything with the ivy and just painted around it when they would come and paint this uh, retaining wall. Did you just do this so, on your own then, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I just city? did it on progressive weekends and uh, holidays, I would just go up and spend an hour or two and just continually removing um, huge quantities of this. And because I didn't have the capacity to get rid of it, I would end up stacking it in huge piles at either end of the ramp and just let nature dissolve it all into, uh, into uh, compost. I was wondering if you put a little bit in your green bin every, <laughs> every week or whatever. Okay. A little bit, but there was way too much. So this uh, picture on the left is uh, standing at one end of the ramp coming up and then continuing up. And um, so on the right hand side, uh, that's all been taken over by, I guess, what's called uh, Santa Barbara daisies. And I'm leaving those alone because they're nice and, uh, and it's better than having the oxalis, which um, would, would like to grow. And I keep on uh, keeping after the, the oxalis. On the left, um, there's a continuation of the gardening I've done. I moved, took a, not only did I take away the English ivy, but I cut back the um, the cotoneaster and other plants that were uh, creating a cave-like effect. And so those are some plantings that you can see there. On the right-hand side, um, uh, for the most part, you're seeing all the different plants that I've put in. All these plants, for the most part, came from uh, cuttings from friends and also from free tables at the uh, Succulent Society or the Bromeliad Society. Um, so all the different groups that I go to and have free tables, um, I'll grab some cuttings and just kept sticking them in the ground without doing anything really special, just kind of poking a hole and stuffing them in and see what happens. And by and large, things happen. Um, you know, I haven't had a huge amount of die off from things that I put in the ground. And it certainly helped that we had so much rain last year to really get things uh, kicked into high gear. In that picture on the right, in the background on the left, you can see that's a huge pile of the uh, stuff that I've cut down and just thrown into a big stack. And, uh, and it's just kind of slowly um, going into the soil. Did you have to, to dig to the up the roots for the ivy or did it, was it pretty much surface and you cut it back or? Um, mostly I would just rip out what I could get to. I didn't spend a lot of time pulling out roots. Um, and, and because I'm so persistent with it, um, my experience is that you, there's not a lot of payoff for trying to get rid of the roots. The, the roots are going to come back. And, um, so I just pull off whatever comes up at the top and, and see how the plant reacts over time. Um, so it's still there. It's still actually pr creating a screen from Portola which will keep people from doing cow paths down through the garden. And so I, there's still some benefit to having the plants along Portola. It's just that I've cleared out what's below and, uh, and I'm keeping that screen for the, the benefits it provides. So how much time do you do on it now? How much time? I, not, well, I, I, I retired about six, seven months ago. And so I have more time than ever to spend on it. And uh, I'll typically go up two or three times, maybe more a week and just pull out little things that keep coming up, uh, like the ivy. The other big one that keeps coming up is um, um, nightshade, a uh, little nightshade, which, you know, they have surprisingly deep and sturdy roots, even with the little tiny um, seedlings that come up They're They're very persistent. And so that's one of the main weeds that I keep after. Um, and so I'm, I'm constantly just pulling out little tiny weeds and then putting in new plants because I'm always got something to put in up there. And then also the slope, you can see that it's kind of a pretty good 
slope about 40 degrees. And, um, and so that's a constant source of things just spilling down onto the, uh, the ramp. And so I do a little bit of uh, community volunteerism by keeping the ramp cleared off of the uh, soil and other debris that falls down onto the concrete. How close do you live to that? I'm, uh, oh, if in the picture on the left, um, in the distance, you can see cars parked. That very mm -hmm. first car that's parked is my car behind my house. Oh, well, nice and close. That's good. Yeah, real close. Oh, that's cool. And uh, so this is a better view of um, the the long um, stretch that comes down from the, the the tip, which the tip gets full sun, and this this longer stretch is a little bit shaded. Very close to us is a as a, as a nice geranium. They're, I'm finding that the geraniums really love this environment, and um, everyone that I put in is is done well. I've only recently joined the Bromeliad Society, and uh, so, but the, they're very generous with with the giveaways of people's uh, cuttings, and so I'm expecting there to be a lot of interesting Bromeliads over time to complement the uh, other succulents, and along the uh, the concrete edge is this uh, kind of becoming a low hedge of, of, uh, well, Beanie. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that eventually I think is going to create a barrier to things falling down onto the concrete. Mm. And so that's nice. Is it the yellow one or the orange one you have there? Um, these are mostly yellow and uh, friends of mine have given me some orange. So we'll see if the orange, uh, kind of starts filling things in. And then I'm going to switch things out. Uh, so I, I, I started with a bunch of aeonium, but uh, I think I'll be calling the aeonium for more interesting plants over time. Okay, and that was that. Uh, so that's a fun project. I just wanted to share that and I'll share more pictures over time. And here are two other things that are going on. Um, on the left, um, uh, I moved into my house about 12 years ago. And ever since then, I've been um, just kind of obsessively sieving out rocks from the sandy soil uh, around my house. And I didn't want to put the rocks into the green bin. And so I just kind of started piling them up. And, uh, and over time, as I did so much more sieving and pulling out more and more rocks, um, I ended up with quite a big pile of rocks out in the, uh, this little space behind the house outside my fence and right near where I parked my car. And then I just sprinkled a little soil on it and started putting in the extra plants that we all end up with over time. And, um, and so this is what I call my bonus garden. And um, I just kind of splash some um, cistern water on it every so often. And uh, it's, it's become a really fun thing. I really enjoy it. Every time I go out to the car, I walk past it. And so it's, it's become a real uh, fun little bit of four by four gardening. Extra real estate. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's all and it's right on top of concrete. So it's like it, at its deepest, it's probably uh, six inches deep. And that that plant life that you see there is all sitting on top of just concrete. On the right, um, this is something I brought up at the um, one of our last meetings, um, which we were all in person. And it was all about I have this um, hazelnut, this Corellius cor uh, avelina contorta. And it was getting too big for my garden. And so I cut it back and I was going to remove it. And uh, I got as far as getting it down to just a four foot high trio, trio of stumps and decided, wait a minute, maybe this will be pollardable. And, um, and so this is an example of uh, all of the stems that have grown in just one year from the tip of a branch that was left um, to see what would happen. And I've decided after reading up on it that uh, I'll, I won't cut these, I'll do it every other year. And that'll give me a chance to enjoy the, uh, the catkins that a hazelnut produces every spring. And so uh, this is an ongoing project, which I'll continue to share. Uh, so probably next winter, I'll cut back all the branches that you see. And every other year, I'll be cutting it back. So just another fun thing. Jeff mentioned he's uh, just retired, so uh, he's our newest member on the board. So thank you, Jeff. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, those are amazing projects, Jeff. Thanks. Oh, really wonderful. Mary. Okay. Yeah, well, it's winter, so the um, lacanalias are all flowering. Uh, not all, but some of them are just, they were 
tiny bulbs when I got them this fall. And so they'll be a little bit further um, longer to sprout, but they're native to the Western Cape as we know. And this, um, I love both of these. This is the Viridifolia, which I see far less often than I see the orange yellow types. And um, this one actually, the Viridifolia comes up with turquoise flowers and then it flowered again, uh, I guess early mid fall this last year and it was white with pink same plant it was so bizarre but i think it just i mean it didn't have the light that it needed whatever light the light is that produces this wonderful turquoise color um it it uh it doesn't happen all year so that and and the the alioides is um also a western cape uh, bulb uh, with fleshy stems and it's the quadricolor is meant to be all these different colors mixed in. The Alioides itself is just yellow with red tips. But so this one you see has more and greens and, you know, or, or yellow bordering on orange and that kind of stuff. It's a wonderful plant anyway. And it flowered right away. I had no problems with it. So um, I, after a point, it's going to go in the ground so that I don't have to keep watering it in the summertime. Wait, Mary, you said it was Western Cape. Why would you water it in the summer at all? Well, you know, actually, that's true. I have a whole area of no water for these plants, and I have little red markers to warn myself because I I kind of go out there and I just water everything, and I've got to stop doing that. So you're right. It, it should only be watered uh, in the winter and in the fall, bringing it into the winter. But it's- I can see you wanting to water it early if we're having a late rain season, but- Yeah. Because I yeah. think it rain sooner. But you're do. right about the summer. It doesn't, it need, and that I'm tending more towards summer dry plants. That's my kind of plant. <laughs> yeah. If I don't have to water it in the desperate times of the summer, so, um, so this one, uh, Adenia mobisum, it, my desert rose, I've picked up a stem of this wherever I see them. People sell them just with the stems and you can get them rooting pretty easily, but try to grow them. They just freak out if you water them. So this is one that you have to be so sparing with the water. Anyway, it's coming along and it's doing really well. And I'm very happy uh, and I'm trying not to water it. And uh, that's about it. I'm hoping I'll have this one longer than I had the its predecessors. Do you grow it inside or outside or both? It's inside now, but it, it's outside in the summertime. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a little more tender. You see the size of the leaves and, you know, we've had some chilly nights. Not We haven't had any frost here in Berkeley yet, but I... I don't trust it to that. And you know, it's related to the plumeria. So, and I've got a plumeria out there too that I mean to bring in, but it hasn't died yet. So we'll see. And that was, that's another one that just struggles and kind of languishes in our climate. But um, if you get it in the right climate, you know what it does. They're beautiful. And this one, if you visit the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. They have gorgeous plants, you know, like four or five feet wide and four or five feet tall, and they're just covered with blooms. It's a gorgeous plant anyway when it's, um, but it, it it is poisonous, but I don't have anybody that eats my plants. And if the bugs eat them, well, so what? <laughs> Let them eat cake. So, uh, anyway, has anybody else tried to grow this plant? Tried. Not successfully. <laughs> yeah, not successfully. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing is that we all try, whether we're successful or not, is almost yeah. hit and miss. But um, yeah, you got to keep that water away from it. Okay, and this one, one, I'm pretty sure I got this from Kristen from the our drawing table and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a winter flowering clematis. And I, you know, is this cir Cirrosa, C-I-R-R-H-O-S-A? You know what? My brain does not function very well anymore with plant names, which is very sad. And I don't know. 
Well, I, I you know, it matches a, a picture online exactly. So well, I'm calling in, I'm calling it Sarosa. Winter, right? Yes. Yes, yep. it's a winter, winter flowering, evergreen clematis. And oh, so your evergreen mine defoliates completely. Does it? Well, I'll have to watch. You know, I haven't um haven't really looked. And you it's see noted leaves, as evergreen. Yeah. You see the leaves on the side where the in a uh, close-up of the plants are, and they're really pretty. They have a little serration on the side, but not yeah. much. And it's a quite a gorgeous plant. I haven't, I read that it was supposed to be fragrant, but I have not noticed the mm -hmm. fragrance. Uh, Kristen, do you, is yours fragrant in your garden? I never thought to smell it. So I, don't I know. Really yeah. I never, I never, right. I haven't either. I will but... do that this year. I mean, it's crawling all over the place now, but I, I yes. like it so much. I don't care because it's blooming now usually. And now you're making me think, I have to go out and see if it isn't why it isn't blooming yet, or maybe it's more like I don't remember going out and seeing it, so to speak. It I, it, it, it kind of sneaks around. It gets yes. in and out in between things and loves to grow up in between trees. So it's growing on a couple citrus trees that I have, and I just have to be careful not to let it um, strangle the citrus. But um, when you started the cutting that I eventually got, did you? I mean, was it a cutting or how did you get it going? I think it was a, a shoot that came up and I dug it up because it was in the wrong place. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, I'll look for that well, as well. I do that on their own. I mean, it isn't a one stem vine and, and it's right. most clematists with the exception of Armandia, I think. That usually makes one big clump on the bottom, but many of them yeah. Are multiple. Yeah. But this one is, I can see if I... <laughs> You know, now that I, I see its habit, I will probably put something there like a, you know, some kind of a wire um, or a, a grate or a fence or something that will just allow it to cascade over that and not on the plant, not on the so, citrus below it. Um, Trichelium, not, what is the star jasmine? I can't think of its botanical name. Trachealus berman? Traculus farm, yeah. And I decided to try and push it to grow in that, and it seems to do it quite successfully. And oh, then nice. I in conjunction with a rose uh, that is a climber. And so I decided years ago that it's more interesting to have uh, vines that are intermingled and then bloom on it. And so one looks like the other is blooming and gives you a longer bloom effect for the yeah. year. Yeah, nice. Okay. Nice. Okay, so Mark, I'll let you go ahead. So yeah, this is a project that I have going on. Uh, and it is, I wish I had done this two or three years ago now. It's uh, 20 degrees out as we speak. And, and it's supposed to get down to potentially 13 degrees tomorrow, which is mm -hmm. pretty catastrophic for around here. We don't usually get that low. I, I've been to nine degrees before, but this project is... Um, is it's basically kind of a poor man's geothermal they call it you take um the air and you basically plumb it into the ground and using a circular fan circulate the air into the ground and uh let's see what's the next slide here how far down do you go oh. down? thank you that's what yeah. i was going to ask yeah so so we tried, I tried to go as deep as possible. They've done these in Nebraska. You can read a lot about them in, um, oh, uh, the Midwest. They go, they'll sometimes go like 10 feet if they don't hit groundwater. I hit groundwater at four feet though. And so I had to set the pipes just above that, but I put a thermometer in there and it was, it was, you can see that's frost on there. It was, the air temperature was about, it was 28 overnight. It was 51 degrees down there at three and a half feet. And so I've, I've been doing some research and in this part of Oregon, our soil temperatures down that, that deep three and a half feet, they lag three months behind whatever is your current air temperature. So it's perfect for here in that by the time we hit December, January, February, that soil temperature is still kind of the warmth of autumn. So October, September, October is 50 degrees is perfect for recirculating it. And 
like I said, we've been frozen solid here right now. And I have all the plumbing in place. Um, I think maybe the next slide shows that. Yeah. So the big manifold there, that's a 12 inch manifold. It's a pretty good size pipe. I have a, a cover on that, but I went out there and, and I have a, a thermometer that you can read. It's a laser thermometer and it, it's 50 degrees down in that pipe. And the air temperature outside is 20 degrees. So being, being able to recirculate that air into the greenhouse is going to be just wonderful for helping to moderate the temperature. And I'm actually, since I grow a lot of alpines, I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to the cooling effect almost as much in the summer. You know, we had 115 degrees here a couple of uh, Junes ago. And I mean, it scorched things and it just torched plants. So cooling in the summer and heating in the winter, just being able to keep just that 20, 30 degree difference in the soil temperature that you might end up with is, is kind of an untapped resource. So I'm looking forward to the project. If uh, I'll talk a little bit about my blog here when I get into the presentation, uh, but you can follow along the project. I'm, I'm just getting ready to build the greenhouse over the top of it. So this is gonna be my main propagation house um, and I do appreciate seeing some of those South African bulbs. I, I grow some South Africans, but I'm, I'm a bit further north than you. And I'm definitely on the margin of, of what we can do. In 2009, I had nine degrees for a low in the nursery here, and it never got above 20 for the daytime temperatures. And I lost a huge collection of South Africans because I, I didn't have a, any heat source in the greenhouse at the time. So um yeah, fun project. I'm excited to see how it turns out and hopefully very economical way to heat a greenhouse because you're really just using a fan to blow the heat in. And I'm hoping if I can work it out, try to figure out to have the fan set up on a solar system too. So it's kind of completely off the grid. So does that um, tubing go zigzagging through the, underneath there at three and a half feet? below and then come out at some other point or does it have it in different spots that it comes up or how's that work yeah it's it's kind of hard to see there's a on the far end where the excavator is there's a already that 12 inch pipe that's buried in there and they're all plumbed in there and mm -hmm. then that nursery pot that you see right near the bucket on the excavator is a stand pipe and then on the other end there's they're all so they they go in straight runs and it's hundreds of feet. It's a, I think it's 400 and something feet of six inch pipe that's plumbed into 60 feet of the 12 inch pipe. And so the whole idea is you kind of want to slow the air down mm -hmm. and it, it, it kind of has to have a, a residence time as it travels through there so that it, it has time to kind of buffer with the soil temperature. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. So do you have different intakes or one intake and one outtake one intake and one outtake yeah okay, so uh, it slithers it. through there and either cools down or heats up and then it comes out the other end comes out the other end yep and so you you want to take the hot air from the top so it'll be eventually it'll be plumbed up to the top of the greenhouse pulling the hot air down and circulating it and then coming up and and hopefully cooling it down or reverse it in the in the winter and then get that heating effect going on so my question for you is because i always, i wanted to do this years ago but i wanted to do it for the house and my question to you is eventually if you're pulling hot air from the summer and putting it into the ground to cool the greenhouse get that ultimately doesn't the soil become even warmer because now you've been heating it up during the summer yeah, I've been trying to research that. And I, there's, like I said, a lot of this has been done in, in Nebraska, Minnesota, where right. it's very, very cold uh, in the winter. And they've said, you know, you're kind of, you have so much thermal mass there. You're basically, you're never really going to heat up the the earth and you're never really going right. to cool down the earth. And so they said it, it, it basically really, you just sort of maintain a nice, even temperature and then you can degrees. you can use that there there is some talk about phase change how when you you take the the warm moist air and pump it underground where it's cool then it it condenses and all mm -hmm. the water drops out of it basically and you kind of you're storing that temperature difference there in the phase change mm -hmm. 
from you know humid moist greenhouse air now drops out and becomes uh liquid and there's a energy that's produced in that phase change thing there so that goes a little bit beyond what i'm doing i'm trying to really just kind of keep that that soil temperature even buffer to be able to pump that air into the greenhouse but it's not a huge footprint either. You know, like I said, some of these, they'll go nine feet deep and they'll do like four runs of these four stacks of them. So it's a huge volume. And then they're growing citrus in Nebraska where it's 10 below in the winter. So it's worked there. I'm hoping it works in Oregon. I'm, I'm only just trying to keep barely frost free because I actually grow a lot of bulbs that like a winter dormant. So a lot of the stuff from the Central Asian steppe they actually kind of want to have that cool, uh, you know, dormant period. So we'll see. It's it's an interesting experiment for sure. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for sharing. The one thing I'll say, if any of you have a pond, I in the research I ran across, they said actually one of the best things you can do is if you have basically the plumbing pipe like this, you sink it in a pond because down at the bottom of the pond, that that's a really great thermal mass storage basically it's always the temperature is going to be really even keel so that was one thing I'm I'm hoping eventually to dig a pond and then have that as another potential source to do uh, basically like a floor geothermal floor heating system in a greenhouse if you can do it with a pond why can't you do it with in your groundwater then I wonder uh, I'm, I actually thought that today I was out there and looking because that I we we sunk a, a basically sort of like a dry well down into that groundwater water. I wanted to see how far it went. So we we dug a an eight foot hole and groundwater is at four feet. So I have four foot of groundwater basically in a in a pretty good pipe system. And I thought, you know, what if you put coils down in there and then circulate water through the coils that I haven't done the measured the temperature of the groundwater yet, but I want to see it's got to be close to what the earth temperature is. So, you think so? yeah. Interesting. Untap and one, I'll say one last thing on this, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too long here, but it was on the, I'm a Pacific Bulb Society member and I, I posted this up there and there was some discussions and um, it turns out in England, in the UK, uh, a, a fellow wrote in there and he said, oh, back in the like 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, people used to always excavate under their greenhouse and then they would stack bricks to make an air chamber basically and then cover over the top of that and they would circulate the air down into it. it it's like it's this is nothing new. He said that used to be really commonplace that people did it all the time. They basically had this brick air chamber underneath their greenhouse to to help moderate it so it's like there's nothing new under the sun it's just kind of funny that we've gotten away from some of these tried and true potentially ec you know economical environmental ways to heat a, a greenhouse or cool it down okay well thank you for that charlotte yeah i got this plant at peacock nursery a couple of years ago and it wasn't sure what color the flower was going to be i finally got a bloom now i know the color of the flower <laughs> <laughs> and I snuck in a picture of the Mendocino Botanic Gardens and how tall it grows up through the trees and such on the, in there. Charlotte, have you had any trouble with frost? Is Lapageria a, a tropical plant? It's in a it's pot but in the garden. It's close to my deck. I don't know if that helps it or not. Um, no, I've seen it growing uh, when I went with Martin Grantham to Chile and we were pretty far south. And it was a huge plant, which covered the whole front part of this hotel in full bloom. And wow. um, it gets, it, that's, it's near a ski area. Ah, we saw it in the uh, Nocafagas forest in Chile. Yeah, they get cold there in Chile too, you know. People don't realize that. And then um, you're on, Kristen. Uh, this is Phlox Drummondii, and I brought this in to show to you uh, because I'm trying to get the nurseries to put it out as a winter blooming plant along with cyclamen and other, but they only sell it into the fall, and then they, they keep saying, oh, no, it doesn't grow cold. 
and I've had it for years now and I use it. I, I now have to remember to buy it in the fall to plant it into my pots because it blooms all winter. And granted, I know that we're no longer as cold as we were, but um, nevertheless, I just don't think it's so hard to convince the, the retail nurseries to go back to the growers and tell them, uh, you know, you should try this or they don't want to take the risk or I don't know, whatever. It may have to get growing in uh, warmer weather before it'll. Um... No, no, I got these. I got them right in October or late October, early November. It doesn't need the warmer weather at all. For me, the warmer weather is a problem because that's when they start failing. So they're just, I mean, this is, I took these pictures yesterday and we've seen our coldest snap. We hit 27 this year. So it's red and green, blue and pink. This is what I'm most excited about. So early on in Cal Hort in the early nineties, David Fikes, many of you know him, told me, get, had brought in all these acmeas and told me, Oh, Kristen, you can't grow those. It's too cold. Now, I understand there is a book out now that says you can grow them in the ground. But those, I said, well, can I try? And he said, of course you can try. He now knows never to challenge me. He says, like throwing down the gauntlet. And in those first years, the they suffered a little bit from the cold. But now, of course, with it being as warm as it is, they literally bloom all the time. So that led me to start exploring and I do grow near Agelias. I've grown those now for probably 15 years in the garden, which are considered a very warm bromeliad, warm uh, growing plant. And they do act like perennials. So they will lose when we, when we had colder weather, they would lose all their leaves, but they would come back. So I would say that the near Agelias can easily do uh, 20. I haven't seen 20 in a while, mind you now. They don't freeze back anymore at 27. So last year, you know, people gift you plants and then I get caught up and Trader Joe's always has really good prices. And so I'll buy them just for decorative purposes. And I was accumulating a lot of this decoration. And I thought this is getting to be ridiculous. So last spring, and I've learned with tropical plants, if you're going to grow them in the ground here, you have to grow them in the spring, you have to put them in the ground in the spring. Um, a plant delights. Tony Avent told me that that's how you get a tropical plant to survive. It gets enough carbohydrates in the roots. And even if it gets frozen back, it'll come back. And I have grown a lot of tropical plants under that advice very successfully. So I don't even know what these are. Well, the one on the left is uh, Avresia. I just got an email from a friend of mine who's in the Bromelia Society. And I thought I saw on the web, it's either called the Talancia or a Vresia, but this is a Vresia because it has yellow flowers. Uh, Talancias have blue flowers. And um, I've had this, it started blooming in July and it has not stopped blooming. And I literally took this picture just to, to be honest, I took this picture yesterday to be sure that I was showing you that this plant will survive the cold. And next to it is one, I don't even know what it is, but uh, I had, I, it, this was successfully blooming in my house. But as I said, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I have to reduce my inventory in pots. So I stuck it in and that has been blooming all summer as well. This, I didn't have the name, it's Acmea recurvata. I, I'm beginning to fail in my name recollection, but I got the name just now. And this is one of the early bloomers. The flowers are a little bluer than what uh, the photograph shows. And you can see it's under the trees. It gets leaves on it. I didn't bother cleaning anything out, but I took a close-up for you to see so that you could see what the color is. Okay, is that next. the same plant? Both those, I'm not yes. the exact yes. same plant, the same species? Yeah, well, I, it might even be the same plant. It was just, you know, getting close up enough. I mean, these, these are run, these are very low growing. These particular ones are very low growing. They might only get up to about eight inches or so. And so you have to look down into it, but it's a great ground cover. And just so you understand, they made it through the drought without a problem. They're very droughty. And, um, but I do overhead water. Remember when you grow a bromeliad, 
in a pot they always tell you to water into the cup and uh one of the reasons i think i'm successful i wouldn't i, I you should definitely try it with drip what am i saying you should always try everything at least once or twice i've decided but um this would definitely be a great garden plant to do water overhead and it doesn't have to have water in it all the time either they're pretty drought tolerant huh yeah, that, well, they made it through all the last drought, and I, I did cut back to under 1,000 gallons a day, and I have a big piece of property. And so I have other things. I, I lost very little. Tropical plants are very droughty. And now, of course, I've already forgotten. This is, oh, yeah, this is a Bilbergia vitata I just got told. I got this from Jack Halpern, who is still alive, if any of you know who he was. He's 102 now. And uh, he had an unbelievable bromeliad collection, and I got to know him through Ted Kipping. And I would go over there and help him weed his pots. And he said, take pieces of everything. And of course, being the plant nerd and greedy person that I am, I did. And I put this in a very protected area. Actually, the tree that you see in bud here is Cornus capitata. But I'm not sure that it even needs that anymore. I was just worried because it was blooming in the winter in his place. Well, it's blooming in the winter in mine now. I love those kind of vase-like ones. Yeah. So the other, the new surprises, I have grown a lot of aloes over the years. I'm always glad if they just make it through the winter. Rarely see any bloom. I don't know what the two on the right are. That one, though, the left one with the sprinkler head near it is aloe ferox. I water my succulent bed in the drought only once a week, but now I'm back to uh, every uh, to twice a week, but um, I never saw aloe ferox grow be a bloom before. It's not very tall. It's maybe you know two feet. Maybe I have a high sprinkler head in there, and I wrote in. I don't know if you blew put that in there, but out when I had Jason Sampson out here, he stayed with me, and I had cut my finger pretty badly doing something that I wish I could do better. And he told me, well, the best thing for your finger is that one over there. Because he looked in my garden because there are poisonous aloes, just for those of you who didn't know. I, and he said, you have no poisonous ones, but aloferrox is the one that I would recommend that you use. And aloferrox uh, sap or whatever comes out of the leaf, like aloe, everybody uses aloe vera because it's clear, I'm sure. Ferrox comes out very yellow, but it does heal really well. And I think there's one more. Or am I? Yeah. So um, Acanthus senii was, I love Acanthus. I'll tell you of all the tropical plants I've ever grown, they are the ones that even in the coldest of times, they might die all the way back to the ground, but they always come back. Uh, in, in eight degrees, I have um, Justitia brasiliensis, literally made it through eight degrees. The roots survived eight degrees. And um, the the purple purple passion one, which I can't, strobilanthus something or other that has the purple leaves, that has made it through all the winters in the last, I think, 20 years. I just, I do cuttings and I just put them everywhere because I'm trying to find, I'm trying to get more and more of them to grow because it's just such wonderful color because they're extremely drought tolerant. So this is Acanthus senii out of Ethiopia. It's also sometimes called Acanthus ethiopica or something like that. But, um, and it's blooming today. And I just love the fact it's very hard to get orange blooming at this time of year. In you know, there, maybe in some of the annuals like calendulas, but to have, you know, a shrub or anything blooming orange at this time of year is very little. And look at that intensity of color. It's you, some of you might think of it as red, but. Yeah, it's pretty. I love the uh, foliage too. The uh, Secret Garden website said it uh, was a great plant to, uh, to um, plant beneath your teenage daughter's window. <laughs> so that was funny. Yes, it is a painful foliage. And I did last year ask, I don't know, I've tried propagating it and never had any success, but I had my gardener dig out because it kind of grows with shoots and I had him dig out a, pe a couple pieces and I tried growing it dry because I figured it's from Ethiopia, but that didn't work last year. It didn't come back. 
I mean, it didn't survive. Mm -hmm. I always try stuff. I still am experimenting at my late age. What gardening's all about. Janet Hoffman on. I am still here. So. Oh, you are. Okay, great. I just sent these in because you were soliciting some pictures and I had taken these pictures in my yard for some, a friend asked me, what do you have in bloom now that will attract hummingbirds? So, um, mm. and this is what I have in bloom now that will attract hummingbirds. So these two Arctostaphylus, the Sentinel has been blooming for a while now and it's, it's in my front yard and it's got, I think I planted from one gallon three years ago and it's now about three feet by three feet. So pretty fast. fast and then this austin griffiths is a um, cultivar that i got from um there's a small nursery called linda vista natives which is in um san jose west san jose near me mm. he kind of does all all kinds of native plants in his um basically in his yard and um but he he has not he's Grown into a pretty, pretty nice nursery, and he has a big selection of, of Arctostaphylus. What does Austin Griffiths do that others might not? It's a, a cultivar of the one that you commonly see in the mountains here that's fa fairly tall. Is so it a tree-like one? Yeah, it's a tree-like one. It's, it gets, mm. yeah, it gets up to eight or ten feet tall, but um, it has a pinker flower. In the same season. Nice. So, and that one's that was also planted for one gallon. It's about four feet tall now. Same time? Uh, a year later, actually. Oh, so, okay. Great cluster. Going to town. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite shrubs for year-round bloom, and the hummingbirds love it, is the bladder pod, the peritomia, peritoma arborea. Very drought tolerant. It can be pruned a lot of different ways. It makes it kind of a pretty open shrub. And like I said, it blooms pretty much year-round, and the hummingbirds love it. It's not pink, but hummingbirds still like it. I have one of those on a fairly steep slope, which I, maybe the, that's its downfall, but it doesn't do diddly squat. Really? Yeah, it's been there about this a year. Is, this is the second one I had in this location. I, the first one, I ended up moving some things around and then pulling it out and then replanting another one. But <laughs> I've had, I think I've had it growing in a similar location out in full sun in the backyard for 15 years at least. Oh, nice. I love the plant, but yeah. Wish it did better for me. And I don't, I don't have particularly good drainage and I don't water it at all. So the soil is, I'd say a sandy clay, but, um, and I'm, but I'm river, I am riverbed. There's a lot of rocks. Oh, okay. Drainage. Probably good drainage too, huh? That help that helps the drainage some. Yes. I mean, otherwise it's flat ground. So there isn't great drainage, but the rocks help. And then the Ribes malvasium, um, most of the cultivars are blooming right now, but the, the Christie Ridge is a nice one that I have um that's been on the ground for a number of years and it's probably eight or ten feet tall and is wide right now wow beautiful it's growing underneath a pepper tree you can see some of the pepper tree branches above it and so it gets partial shade but it gets some afternoon sun and it leafs out about the same time it starts blooming right, right now it it's not really long deciduous but so is, it lost its leaves for maybe two months in this fall but the leaves are coming back out with the flowers now how long will it bloom? I know um, when we went to go see uh, um, Saxon Holt's garden, he had this beautiful, I think it was Malvasia though as well. I don't remember what the cultivar was, but it was uh, in full beautiful bloom in March. Does this last that long? Or is this an earlier bloomer? It starts blooming, started blooming in December and it probably will still have some flowers on it in March. Wow. They do look this quite a while, yeah. Nice. And then Epilobium, of course, is just, finishing its blooming but um that bloomed more through the fall and i usually cut it way back the eater eye pretty much to the ground when Sometimes late january and then it starts coming up again so you haven't done it yet though i haven't done it yet no is this a very tall one it, it gets about three feet tall oh good that's what i have then i didn't know that i just got a piece from george Greeley about what 30 years ago he didn't know what it was and I stuck it in the ground and now I can't, I unfortunately put it in a watered garden and you never can get rid of it out of a watered garden. This I plant, I planted this. It's in a kind of a rock wall I have across the back of my yard and I planted one, one gallon again, probably 30 years ago, like you. 
and it pretty much covers 30 feet of rock wall. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have my gardener dig it out, and he gets so worried. He said, don't worry, it'll be back next year. Yeah, I, 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 I cut, I shear it completely back. I rip out the parts where I don't like it, and I can pretty much keep it in the rock wall, so. Yeah, well, now I just was at my daughter. She just bought a ranch in Clayton, and I, I know it grows dry, so we're lining the driveway with it. I thought that would be pretty going up the yeah. hill. Yeah, it should be. I've got some in a planter bed out by the street, too, where it gets no water. And I don't want something I don't have to take care of, and it grows great. So, And it blooms late. I mean, for me, it doesn't start blooming until late October. This one, mine actually started blooming, I'd say, August or September. Well, then maybe it isn't what I, it isn't what I have because mine has always been an, an October, November bloomer. Well, mine did last through the fall, but um, but they start, yeah. they sit, the epilomiums in general seem to have started blooming earlier this year than past years. I don't know why. Maybe because of all the rain. Possibly because we had such a cool summer. That might have done it. Yeah, that's, that's true. The summer was very cool this year. Thank you, Janet, for sharing those. And that's all, folks. Well, good night. Have a good rest of your evening. And uh, we'll see you in February. If you have any suggestions or anything, please reach out. Good night. Thank you. And thank you so much, Mark. That was really wonderful. That was really that good. Was, thank, thank you for having you. me. Great.